welcome to episode nine of Point Me to Jesus. I'm your host, Tara McCleary Reeves, and I am thrilled to share with y'all one of my dearest friends today, Melissa Gibbs. Melissa and I have been blessed to journey through some, some harsh valleys together, and we're going to get into that. So today you may see a few tears shed, but I'm just so grateful to have a girlfriend that in the valleys continues to look to her maker and her sustainer for every step that she takes. Melissa Gibbs is a beautiful wife, a beautiful mom, a beautiful friend. She has four boys uh, ranging in ages from 22 years old down to 16. Jackson is her oldest. Jackson is 22. And then we have Miller and then Jason and Taylor. And um, I'm hopeful to introduce at least one of those guys as my son-in-law one day. I'm in. Melissa and I have been praying about that. We continue, boys, we continue to pray <laughs> about that. But, uh, but I'm just so grateful for this girlfriend that uh, has prayed with me and has encouraged me. And I know as well she will encourage you. Melissa is an alumnus of Clemson University. And there she studied psychology. She then went on to East Carolina to pursue a master's in family therapy. Is that right, Melissa? Right, marriage and family therapy. Now she is in school yet again. Uh, she's receiving another degree, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that in uh, school counseling. So, right. Melissa, welcome to the show. I want you to tell um, our viewers kind of how we really bonded um, at first through uh, Taylor and our son Daniel's walk through the journey of leukemia and then most recently as we celebrated uh, the graduation of your beloved JD. Yeah we have a really odd amount of touch points between our two families in that my in-laws are acquainted with both your parents and your in-laws. My husband and your husband were friends. Yeah. Um, I went to school with and was a sorority sister of your sister. Yeah. And yeah. then you guys end up moving to Charlotte and JD and Lee connected. Yeah. And um, I think very shortly after you moved to Charlotte was when um, Daniel was diagnosed with leukemia. It was. And my son, Taylor, our youngest, had been diagnosed six months prior. Exactly. So uh, JD and Lee got in touch again on the basis of that, hoping that I might be able to help you navigate some of what you were going through. So we began to form our friendship on the basis of being two moms in the trenches of pediatric cancer. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I can remember vividly that first day of Daniel's admittance at Levine Children's Hospital yep. and you and JD were the very first couple of course they allowed y'all to to come down those halls because y'all were still in treatment with Taylor as well mm -hmm. and how the Lord knitted our hearts together and I can tell you exactly as you can the year that that, that was um, that was April 30th um, and for us January 9th of that same year mm. And so, yeah, we began this friendship based on that. And then you ended up going to the same school that my kids went to and became the carpool mom. And I can't even call it a carpool because I did nothing. I didn't, I wasn't pooling. Um, but you did that as a, a service to me at a time when I was caring for JD and spread thin. And um, you took it upon yourself to find any way that you could serve and taking the kids to school was definitely one of them. And so now our kids are friends because they spent a lot of time together. Yeah, and I'm just so, and I hope it in, does encourage our viewers to see just how the Lord uh, just put us in each other's path at again, that providential time and sharing the gifts, um, whatever the Lord's given us, whether it be our time or um, you know, a meal or, or however, you know, your gift basket even um, of encouragement that first night of Daniel's treatment was just so refreshing to me because that. <laughs> you having, you know, been, well, you were right there in the midst of Taylor's diagnosis as well and his treatment. And so you knew exactly the right books that I needed. You, you knew the exact 
um, wipes that I needed and a chapstick for those dry moments in the hospital and those encouraging snacks and everything. So we, we do have an amazing history together. And so, you right. know, when, when I say I love you, I, I mean it deeply because um, our hearts are truly um, connected for life. And um, I'm just grateful. I consider you more a sister than a friend and how, you know, as we've raised our children together, you know, you and I are so like-minded too as godly moms. We've even done the same, not only chosen the same Christian school and South Lake Christian Academy, but the same curricula. I mean, we walk together through Family Life's Passport to Purity with, right. with our children and, and held each other accountable on the computer with the, uh, the covenant eyes. And, you know, we've just mm -hmm. been able to share resources together. And I think that was why the, the Lord impressed you so much on my heart, Melissa, even at the beginning before uh, launching this out of quarantine, this point me to Jesus. And I've chosen people to appear on this program that I know personally that not only point me to Jesus, but you're pointing your children to Jesus. You're, you're truly walking the walk behind the computer screen mm -hmm. And I've seen it in action. You know, I've, I've told you before that I knew you were going to become my best friend soon after we moved to Charlotte. And I walked into a sandwich shop. Uh, you weren't there, but uh, the boys were. And it was very crowded. And they had gathered at a corner table. And it was all four of them at the time on this particular day. And I was waiting in line and I knew exactly who they were. And of course they knew who I was because our families have shared Christmas card pictures for, for years. But um, they each had their sandwich. And before they dove into it, these four hungry boys probably coming back from their athletic practice, they all four bowed their head and blessed their food at that table. And, you know, I've encouraged as, as long as, as Lee has too, our children to always pause to give thanks for their meal, no matter where they are or how busy they think they are, never to neglect time to thank the Lord for providing. Mm -hmm. And watching your four do that, you know, it was just such a reflection on the type of mom you are. They were just seeing them. I was able to see you and I was able to see JD. And then we didn't even mention that our boys actually won a football championship oh, together. That's right, I forgot that. In White Storm, how could we yes. forget? Yes. JD, uh, your husband uh, was the head coach and then his dad, Joe Gibbs, many of our viewers may know Joe from uh, the NFL as well as uh, my father-in-law, Dan Reeves. And that's another unique fact because mm -hmm. our families used to face each other on opposing sides of the football field. And, uh, but, but off the field, we were each other's best friends because we were definitely connected because of our relationship to Christ Jesus. But right. tell our viewers a little bit about that. You and I would bring snacks to all those boys. And I think it was 2011 White Storm won the, the championship. Yeah, um, I think that was Miller that was on the team with Dan. Yeah. Um, yeah, Joe, when he tells White Storm stories, still uses a Daniel reference. So uh, he made an impression. Oh, and um, yeah, those were great times. Mm. Those were great times. Is it hard for you? And tell, tell our viewers what happened just, just this last year, because I know it's fresh. You and JD were not high school sweethearts, but you were actually um, middle school, I guess, seventh, seventh right. grade's middle school. Right. You were seventh grade middle school sweethearts. And then after he played at William and Mary uh, mm -hmm. and you were at Clemson, then y'all got married. So you actually celebrated 25 years of marriage before his graduation to heaven. Is that correct? Yes, we did. Um, I was living in Northern Virginia at the time his dad was coaching, and that's when we were first boyfriend and girlfriend, but there was a lot of gaps in between seventh grade and getting married in 1993, but I really feel like the Lord allowed us to, uh, even though I moved away, I moved to South Carolina and he remained in Northern Virginia, the Lord allowed our paths to bump into each other every couple of years 
Yeah. And then we, he split us apart again because it was not time. I was living a very different kind of high school life than JD was. And I think we would have been oil and water had we been raised in the same community and gone to the same high school, which we yeah. would have. So I think the Lord didn't want us to forget about each other, yeah. but he didn't want us near each other at the time because it would have been spoiled. So um, the time was right in midway through college and our paths crossed again. I was not a believer at that time. Um, he was walking with the Lord and it was really his example that brought me to Jesus because he was the first person that I met for whom Christ really mattered. Mm -hmm. I had friends who went to church when they were in high school, but they lived like I did, you yeah. know, every other minute of the day. So I didn't really understand. And I wasn't church. I wasn't raised in the church myself. I didn't really understand that there was anything more to being a Christian than just celebrating Christmas mm -hmm. and saying that you believe in God. And like, this is really how I thought. And it seems silly, but having a bell curve and falling at a certain place on that bell curve who knows where the line would be. I don't know where I imagined the line was, but you just had to be better than the people on the other side of the bell curve. So being a good person, celebrating Christmas, that's pretty much all there was. Yeah. And then I met JD and saw that it was so much more yeah. and realized for the first time that I wasn't a believer. And see, that's kind of the thing. You have to see your need before you can reach out and accept. And so he was that person for me that showed me that there was more to it. And not only was there more to it, but it was really a very attractive thing. It wasn't nerdy or weird or um, self-righteous or boring. It was a really, really, really attractive thing about him. And six months into our dating relationship, he wasn't pushy, um, but six months into our dating relationship, I did become a Christian and, um, we ended up getting married and, and, and I, he never would have married me had I not, but I'm glad he didn't tell me that because I might've done it for the wrong reasons. Tell us a little bit about y'all's involvement in NASCAR because JD was the president of Joe Gibbs Racing and Melissa, you flew as much as he did on the weekends and uh, the influence that you've been within that racing community is tremendous. Can you speak a little to that? Well, he certainly had a, a much larger footprint there than I did. Um, I was mostly staying home on the weekends yeah. because we had four kids and they had birthday parties yeah. and yeah. You know, football and so forth. So he was gone a lot on the weekends. Um, and he did, um, he did influence a lot of people. He certainly influenced the culture of Joe Gibbs Racing. And what I hear is that it just isn't the same over there now that he's not there anymore. Um, but he was very well respected in the NASCAR community, very well liked, um, knew everybody and knew people personally, really yeah. cared about people, uh, was involved in the ministry that serves the NASCAR community, which is called Motor Racing Outreach. He was on their board. Uh, so it was a big loss for the sport when he was no longer there. Certainly a loss for Joe Gibbs Racing because that was... Um, you know, Joe's idea for the legacy that he would pass on is that the, the JD would run the team. Yeah. And so JD's illness really um, disrupted everything. But it wasn't without filtering through the Lord's hands. And we know that it felt super disruptive to everything we had laid out and planned. But I do know that he um, has a purpose in it. And that has been my bedrock. Yeah. And take us back to the, to the day. I, I know, I know when it was announced publicly, but personally, you and I knew when it actually JD, it being JD's illness. Can you take yeah. us back to that day where things just something wasn't right? Yeah. Um, it's, it, the, the final diagnosis for him, it was a neurodegenerative, it was under the umbrella of dementia, a very rare form of dementia, not hereditary, not caused. Um, it just was. And um, it's one of those things that you know that it's been there for quite some time before it gets to the level that it is 
obvious and needs medical attention. So we don't know exactly when it started, but I do know that there were a years prior to finding yeah. out, which for us was in 2014, mm -hmm. where he was just off. He was different. It, um, the breakdown in the brain began in the frontal lobe, which is your personhood, your personality, your sense of humor, your judgment, your discernment, mm -hmm. your empathy. And so he was just different. His personality was different. Mm -hmm. And so that affected us relationally. Mm -hmm. But we were in midlife. We had four kids. Life was really busy. There right. are just a million different logical explanations that you can assign right. to somebody behaving a little differently. You know, too much stress at work, not happy at work, um, you know, too busy, not making time for our relationship. So you assign away what is right in front of your face until you just can't anymore. Yeah. And there was an aha moment, a light bulb. I, you know, it's too long to get into the, the details yeah. of it, but we, he and I were in a conversation and I had a light bulb moment. Something's wrong with him. Yeah. And it erased years, years of frustration and feeling like, why is he behaving this way towards me? Why, what is wrong? Why doesn't he ever listen when I tell him, you know, that this, he's not meeting my needs in this area or we're fighting about this all um, I, I just realized something's wrong. And it was almost immediately after that, that we went to the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. And they told us in that visit, that first visit, that they were concerned about a dementing process, mm. but they're not able with any kind of Alzheimer's or any of those, you can't get open up the brain and look at it and see what's in there. It's not something you can fully diagnose until autopsy really. Um, so they had told us they thought it was early onset Alzheimer's and we later on ruled that out. Yeah. Um, but that's what we, that's the news that we left with in September of 2014. And we kept it just to ourselves for six months, just buying time, just not wanting to tell the boys, not wanting to admit it publicly because it, it just, your world's upside down as soon as everybody knows. And so it wasn't until March of 2015 that we had that press conference. Yeah. And then four, four years later. So uh, for, for those four years, um, show us and share with us how the Lord taught you and just enraptured you in his love during that particular time. Well, I think that he made me for this. I really believe that I was made to be JD's wife. I was made to love him and I was made to lose him. Mm -hmm. So the Lord prepared me before I was even a Christian. You know, I was looking back on my life and thinking about how my grandmother was widowed at 36. I never knew her to have a mate. She was just always my grandmother, very comfortable. It wasn't an odd thing. Yeah. Uh, and on the other side, my grandparents, my grandmother, was um, ill with a neurodegenerative disease and her husband cared for her. She stayed home he, until the end. She was never um, you know, put in a, a care facility. So I had these two uh, family examples mm -hmm. of you know, working out your vows to the very end. So I feel like that was in my fabric, that was in my DNA. And then I think the Lord was really kind in giving me a child with cancer, which sounds crazy to say, but I worked out all of my, um, you know, issues with suffering and, you know, why does God allow these things to happen? I worked, I had all that stuff already worked out because I had gone through it so intensely with Taylor. Now Taylor's fine. Yeah. Um, Daniel's fine. Um, we were some of the fortunate Thank the Lord. pediatric cancer moms because um, leukemia is one of the more treatable mm -hmm. childhood cancers. But we were both in that world and we saw a lot of suffering. We yes. met families who did not come out on the good end of cancer. So I feel like I'd worked out all that stuff. I feel like I was in training, like the Lord had me just in, in a, a boot camp kind of thing my whole life preparing for this really horrific experience of daily losing pieces of your husband. And it was not only emotional 
and um, intellectual, it was physical. I mean, he just lost every capability that he had, including, um, you know, the ability to recognize us and converse with us. All of that was gone. Um, but I was ready for it because I had, I'd been put through training. The Lord made sure that I was ready. He made me for it. Yeah. So I do believe that whatever it is that he's asked you to do is, is the path, is the trial, is the suffering that is crafted for you. Yeah. And so you mentioned the boys. Um, I think one of my clearest recollections at the Mayo Clinic when they said, you know, we're concerned about a dementing process. I understood yeah. what that meant. I knew that it was not a treatable thing. It was nothing I was going to be able to, the, the amount of care that I could offer him was not going to move the needle. Yeah. But I was extremely cognizant of the fact that I could save the boys. I could not save my husband, mm -hmm. but I could prevent what we were going through from hijacking their childhoods. Mm -hmm. And so it did become a, uh, that was my battleground. Like I'm going to give JD the best quality of life I can give him. He's going to, uh, you know, we're going to preserve his dignity as best we can. Um, but th the real battle was preserving the boys, having them not go off the rails in rebellion, get angry at God, yeah. um, having them have mental health issues because they're, you know, struggling in a, a sea of uh, abandonment issues or, you know, my mom's not available anymore. My dad's dying. So that was, that was a rallying cry for me. It's yeah. like, we've, we've got to take care of dad together, but I got a, I got four people and I need to still be in the game Yes, because they're still growing up and they need a parent. Yeah. So you know, I, I love, I love to watch the boys watch you. And somehow, and I don't, when I say somehow, yeah. um, we know it was the Lord. We know who somehow is, but, um, I am okay. Um, uh, my children are okay. We, um, we're going to make something out of this. And I think that is my, it's my, if we had to go through it, there darn well better be a point to it. Well, it became the, and I, I shared this with you in years prior that you were, you almost became a mom of five boys, not just four, mm -hmm. um, because as the disease was taking hold of JD's mind uh, and, and he remained just his attitude throughout. I mean, he, he never got angry or never argumentative. I mean, he, he right. truly hit the Holy spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control that that fruit was so evident in his life as it was in yours. But, you know, towards the beginning when, when things were starting to decline and things were getting different, I mean, you really had to keep the car keys away from, from okay. five boys at the time. Yes. So, it was, it was really difficult. I look back on it and I think, I really don't know how we did it. Oh, it's just totally the Lord. You know, and Psalm 22, okay. I love this truth in Psalm 22. He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the, of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. And I think that you felt that security on a daily basis. Was there ever a time that you just threw up your hands or was it always throwing him up and just in praise? I did not reach a point where I got angry with the Lord or um, questioned his goodness or his sovereignty or why he wasn't stepping in to heal. And I do think it was because he allowed me to work that out separately. Like, yeah. I think he just knew like she won't be able to handle wrestling with me yeah. at the same time that the wheels are coming off of her life. Like I needed to be solid with the Lord. Yeah. So, um, but everybody grieves differently yeah and everybody faces suffering differently and um you know my father-in-law really did struggle with why aren't you showing up god um the concept of reaping what you sow was really hard for him because if you knew jd 
he was a great guy. I mean, I could expound on that, but let me just say in a nutshell, he was a great yeah. guy. Yeah. And so um, in the realm of reaping what you sow, JD didn't deserve it. I mean, you could argue that who does deserve something that hideous, but he really didn't deserve it. So that was a struggle for Joe. And um, he has done a lot of work to his credit. Uh, as soon as JD died, he actually went around the country and met with pastors that he greatly respects and had conversations about suffering and healing and um, really worked it out with the Lord. He wasn't content to just uh, be disillusioned and move on. Yeah. He, he was going to slug it out with the Lord and get to a place of peace. And he has, um, I didn't go that way with, with, with God. I really always felt equipped, supported, secure yeah. in what was happening to our family. It did not feel chaotic or out of control. It felt like this is the path that we've been given and this is what we're walking. C.S. Lewis's A Grief Observed, there were two quotes that I just wanted to kind of get your feel of from, from his insight. Uh, and one that is sometimes taken out of context, I'm going to read this entire quote in context. He writes, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. Now that's normally where a lot of, a lot of memes are made out of that particular phrase, but it goes on. He says, I am not afraid but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning, I keep on swallowing. And other times it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting, yet I want the others to be about me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not to me. Mm. Can you identify with, with yes. Can you? Yes. Um, the part, the last part at, at the end where he's talking about, I want people to be around, but I just don't want them to talk to me. Yeah. Um, I've heard that said too, that there's this inner battle between like, you want to be included, but you don't really want to go. <laughs> um, you know, like I want to be asked, but I don't really want to go. Yeah. Um, trying to figure out what, what life is like from here on out. You do have to rewrite the script on what you thought your, you know, golden years in my case are going to be like. Um, I'm not sad necessarily. Um, but there is a, it's not fear but there is a maybe dread mm. of just thinking, is this what, is this what it is now? Um, you know, and I've got oh, 40 years maybe. Mm. Um, so there's a little bit of a dread, even though I know my life will still be great. God has good things in store for me. I am going to have a rich, full life. Uh, if he was done with me, I'd be gone, but I'm still here because yeah. he has plans and good plans for me. But there is this piece of me that feels like, yeah, but it's never going to be as good as it would have been. So there's always that little bit of a, of a longing of like, it's good, but it's not what it should be. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if fear is the right word, but just a little bit of, of, a, of a dread of walking out the mismatch that now occurs when you're alone. Is there a time of day that's the hardest? No, and I think that's only because I still have kids in the home. Yeah. I do anticipate that when I'm an empty nester, there will be different battles. And I, I'm very proactive, I'm a planner, I'm super structured, as you say. So even before JD passed, I started to think ahead to, I need, a, a life. I need to build a life for myself that's going to look different than what I had anticipated. And I'm going to be in an empty nester without a husband at home. And I am in a season of life where I don't know a lot of widows. Most everybody is still married. 
Um, so I went back to school and that's what that was about. I was like, oh, I'll just, I need it. I need to work. I need to have very full days yeah. so that I am relieved to be alone at the end of the day. Yeah. So quarantine for you was, was probably more of a joyous time, really. Living you- my best life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm an introvert. Oh, I so- know. I think that's another uh, thing where, where I say, I think the Lord handpicked me for JD. There's just a lot of things about my personality. I am very matter of fact. So when this tragedy befell us, I didn't fall apart. I was just like, all right, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And you just start walking it out. I am an introvert, so I'm okay yeah. being alone. But I do recognize that it's not good to be alone all the time. And that's why I did go back to school. And, you know, I certainly don't want my kids to ever feel like, okay, have you got mom this weekend? You know, we took her to the beach last weekend. So you guys really need to go like hang out with her this week. I want them to feel like she's okay. She has a life and, and we can have ours. Yeah. That's what I love about you. I mean, of the many things I love about you, but I just, I love the fact that you, you do, you do think ahead. I mean, we, we're, we are, told and, and rightfully so. I mean, he give, give us this day our daily bread and it's not, it's not like you're hiding any manna anywhere, but you are, you know, he's already there, but you are also thinking, you know, how may I serve him best in that particular season of my life? The death of a beloved is an amputation. Mm. Well, an amputation is cutting off something that was a part of you. Yeah. And we were married for 25 years and I no longer have a husband. So it is very much an amputation. It's an amputation of a life. It's not just losing a person, it's losing a life. Mm -hmm. So I had a certain way of, I had a certain social life, a certain um, family dynamic um, and all of that goes. You don't just lose the person, you lose so much of the life that you built together. And that's not to say that what remains isn't still valuable, but it's different. Yeah. And you have to renegotiate the dynamics of it. You have to renegotiate the way that you vacation, um, the way that you spend your leisure time, the roles that you had within your family. Like I don't have another person anymore that does the things that I'm not good at with the boy. I just have to figure out how to do it. Yeah. I gave a sex talk. Yeah. To a 12 year old boy. So <laughs> You know, you just, there, there is an amputation, a loss of something that was mine. It wasn't a part of my physical body, but um, he was mine. He was my man. And um, I had to let go. Mm-hmm. Who, who has ministered to you in a way that has meant the most, not necessarily a person, but just an act of kindness or because there's so many as you and I both know, because we've experienced walking through that valley of pediatric cancer. And, you know, those that I recall that were most meaningful are those that would just sometimes would like y'all, you know, you'd come and just cry with me in the room and not say anything, or, you know, you'd, you'd bring a gift basket of, of items that you used and knew that they were practical and helpful. But through this time, you know, we are called, it's a command to, to care for, widows and orphans specifically. I mean, God's heart for, for, for these is, is an unbelievably tender. So what would be your advice to us? I'll tell you what is a tremendous blessing to me. JD had fantastic friends yeah. and the men who were in JD's life have really been very intentional with my boys. Oh. They see a hole there yeah. and the best way that they can think, you know, when you're going through something like this, there really wasn't a lot that anybody else outside of our immediate family could do for us. Nobody else could take care of JD, Um, but everybody wanted to do something. And it's really been in the wake of his passing that a lot of his friends have found their way to serve JD. Um, They want to make sure that the boys remember him. They love to tell stories about him, send pictures of him. Um, I've got one of JD's best friends does a Bible study with them online. Um, his brother 
is more actually gifted in ways that JD wasn't. So even if JD was still alive, Coy would have had to take these things on, but he's the one that they call when they wanna, uh, you know, one of my kids was restoring a car. Yeah. Uncle Coy comes alongside. Uh, or if you're, you know, I've got another kid that's pretty handy, Jackson, up at, at Boone. He wanted to put steps in down the steep hill off of the cabin. Call Uncle Coy. So um, they're just different ways that people are speaking into their lives. And some friends from even, you know, way back college friends that kind of reconnected and just are really bound and determined that JD's boys are going to know who he was yeah. and some of the amazing things that he did in college or what have you. So that has probably been the most endearing thing for yeah. me is to watch these men step in yeah. and ensure that JD's boys are um, influenced, continue to be influenced by him. There's a lot that I can do because of course I knew my husband very well. Yeah but I'm not a man. I didn't know him in that way, the way that some of his buddies know him, the sports stories, things like that. Yeah. So they've come alongside. It's really cool. Well, you've done a great job with the foundation. In closing, I'm, I'm going to ask you two questions. I'd, I'd like for you to please um, define some of the work that you've done setting up JD's foundation. And then I'd love to know if you could tell us your hero of the faith from God's word. Mm. Okay. So the foundation is JD Legacy, jdgibbslegacy.com. And um, you can go on to that website. And right now the money is directed to Young Life, who is very passionate about that ministry, was on the national board, the local board. He and I were leaders uh, before we got married. I'm still on the local committee. My kids are involved. Uh, so after the service, we have... Um, had about one point, almost $1.5 million come into the foundation that will go to Young Life, primarily serving um, urban communities. Yeah. He was very passionate about that. Yeah. So we did set up the foundation um, in order to keep that going. And then I have some other things that I want to do having to do with the medical aspect, leaving that mess better than we found it, which was literally just good luck to you. Yeah. Um, we got nothing for you. Um, and then, you know, college scholarships at William Mary. I have some other things in mind, but we really did just get the foundation, the paperwork set up a couple of months ago. So still in its infancy. And that's keeping you busy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Um, but we've had the, the service has been watched by golly, um, like 8 million people or something. Yeah. It's I think we're, we're going to put a link to um, the service on there because uh, your eulogy especially was just um, unbelievably moving. You know, you and I were not born when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. I, I always, just because I love style and fashion, his wife, Jackie O, I, I just always love to see her response to things and what she was wearing. Uh, you do remind me so much of her in that her grace, I mean, talking about a grief, grief observed, just uh, the way externally, um, I have no idea where her heart was, um, but watching you as you just radiated in such a beautiful way through that service, Melissa, was just uh, totally, I, I, I'm going to put a link there because I, I do want everyone to go and just watch and especially listen to your part and the boys. The boys part, that's my favorite. I, um, I think I cared more about the service than I cared about my wedding. Oh, I just sure. yeah. wanted it to be everything it could be for the same reason I said earlier, like if we're going to have to go through, if he's going to have to lose his life and my family, my boys now don't have a father, I don't have a husband. We just went through a horrific five years. If we had to do that, <laughs> there darn well is going to be some fruit to come from it. Yeah. So I was very um, cognizant of the opportunity to yeah. stand in front of a wide audience because of JD's influence and his personality, the way he drew people to himself, his last name. Yeah. Um, because of all of those factors, yeah. I knew it would be a full room yeah. and it would be some believers, some not. Yeah. And so um, I am really pleased with how the service turned out because I think it's everything he would have wanted it to be. I'd love for people to watch it. 
and viewers, we're also going to, um, Melissa has chosen as her guest blog that will accompany this interview to share the obituary that she wrote to honor JD's life, which again was just such a testimony of his faithfulness, but also of yours, my sweet friend. So in closing, you're a hero of the faith from God's word. Okay, my guy, guy one. Is, my guy is Gideon. Awesome. <laughs> Tell us why. The reason that he resonates with me is because um, he needed so much reassurance and proof, and that is me. JD always had this very simple, God said it, I believe it. One of my kids has that exact same faith, doesn't question, doesn't struggle. Um, I'm always working it out. I'm always, oh, I see a contradiction in scripture and I have to spend, you know, days pouring into it and figuring out because it just doesn't sit with me. Yeah. Whereas he could say, you know, it'll all make sense when we get to heaven. Yeah. Um, I have that other, um, I don't have the gift of faith and it is a spiritual gift. It is a gift. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of value in what the thinkers and the wrestlers bring to the table as well. But I am that person that's always just a little bit questioning. Yeah. And um, the Lord has given me over time some really undeniable proofs that he's there. Yeah. And um, Gideon had some very undeniable proofs You're right. that the Lord was, was in what he was asking as well. And so I like that. I oh. like what he did there. What an incredible impact that your boys are going to have on uh, on this world is just beautiful in part of course to um to jd's influence but also in great part to a mom that is unwavering in her commitment to the lord jesus christ one takeaway one takeaway because i know you have a profound thought another one um, you know if i were going to write a book and, and I may, if I can figure out the logistics of doing it, yeah. um, it would be about grief and the family conflict that can arise when you're going through something so difficult because you simply don't recognize that the other person is just grieving in a totally different way. So instead of being threatened by it or judging your own grief by somebody else's measure or being annoyed, any of those things, if we just understood that the grief process is so different for different people and could have more grace with each other, uh, that would have really helped me. Yeah. Well, that would be a needed resource. And uh, I have the agent for you. So we'll, we'll talk offline. Okay. I love you. Love you too. Have a great day.